Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you to our uh, to California UMB's second event in our Housing and Social Equity series. Uh, we're going to be talking about closing the racial wealth gap today. Um, my name is Melissa Breach. Um, I am the Chief Operating Officer here at California UMB, and I have the enviable job of moderating this evening's fantastic panel uh, discussion. So um, we are expecting a big crowd tonight, uh, and I see that people are still jumping on. So I'm going to kick it off and start with some housekeeping. Um, this event is going to run for an hour. It'll stop uh, by six. Um, all of our participants are muted. Uh, there's a couple hundred at least of you. So um, if you want to ask a question, we have some great ways to do that. If you are logged into Zoom, the best way to ask a question is to use the Q&A box. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Please note that is separate from the chat box. Um, and for questions, you definitely want to use Q&A. Um, if you are on Facebook Live and watching us, you can just write your question into the comments uh, below. Um, we have a great team of uh, staff moderators who are in both groups. They're going to be keeping track of your questions, um, answering them directly when they can if they're factual, um, and making sure some of those questions get kind of pushed up to us uh, to ask our panelists. Um, so please um, don't hold on to your questions. Feel free to enter them um, as, you, uh, as you think of them. Um, so what does our agenda look like today? Um, I'm going to do this quick introduction, and then I'm going to kick it over to our three panelists. Uh, they are going to talk uh, for about 25 minutes. Then we're going to have about that same amount of time for Q&A. Um, we'll have some short, short closing uh, remarks, and we will wrap up by 6. Um, I want you to know that this event is being recorded, um, and you'll be able to access it on our webpage at californiaemb.org uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, also, after this meeting ends at 6, you're going to get a follow-up email with some links and some resources, um, as well as a short feedback form. Uh, telling us how we did and how we could have made the experience better for you. So please, uh, if you have, can take two minutes, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so for those of you who've, who are joining now um, and who have joined us before, I really just want to say welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are new, if this is your first time to one of our events, if you're new to California EMB, it is wonderful to have you here. Um, uh, right now, uh, candidly, in, in, in this kind of environment where we are also socially distant, um, these events have just been a real bright spot in our in our work experience. So I just want to express how much I appreciate not just our panelists for making time to be here, but also each and every one of you. Um, it is really uh, wonderful to get to spend time with uh, old and new friends and neighbors. Um, so who is California EMB? For those of you who are new, um, California EMB works to end the housing crisis um, and make California an affordable place to live, work, and raise a family. Um, and there, we do that in a bunch of ways. We do that through policy research um, and study. Um, so I'm gonna ask that one of our team members actually take a minute and maybe drop a link to our um, Finding and Staying Home report, which was a report that we did last year that explored the, um, explored the disproportionate impact of the housing crisis on California's women of color. Um, so we do research, we, do, we study policy, um, we also run education programs uh, for lawmakers, for media, for the public. This would be an example of that. Um, and then I think what we're best known for is our legislative and regulatory advocacy. And we do that at the state and local level. Um, and we also don't just pass those laws, but we work really hard to make sure they're properly implemented. Um, and we obviously are a small team and don't do that by ourselves. So I just want to give a shout out to, you know, the over 25 local YIMBY teams that work with us on the ground to make a difference all of the other Yimby orgs uh, in California and across the country that we partner with, all of our um, pro-housing, um, uh, uh, pro-justice organizations that we partner with, three of them who are joining us as panelists today. Um, and uh, that's kind of the core of, how, of our work and kind of how we get it done. Um, I think, as I mentioned, this is the second in our uh, kind of inaugural uh, housing and social equity series. The first one uh, was a couple weeks ago, and some of you may have been on it. It featured uh, Richard Rothstein talking about the color of law. Um, and I think that was a wonderful precursor to this discussion because um, that was really a discussion about how, how the American government, our government, um, deliberately constructed complex policy for the sole purpose of segregating metropolitan areas across the country. Um, and so that was a really important conversation. And I think tonight's conversation is going to look more closely at what impact um, those policies have had, what's going on in our country right now, and, you know, what, what can we do about it? And the amazing thing is that our panelists are all kind of uh, on the ground working in amazing ways to kind of help uh, address our housing crisis, but also address 
the wealth gap, and a host of other kind of uh, related issues. Um, so uh, that's enough of me. Let me uh, let me introduce our panelists really quickly. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they are going to speak, but I'm going to introduce them all now. Um, and I'm doing short intros, so I invite each of each of you to you know extrapolate if there's something that I missed. Please forgive me. Um, first, no, uh, Norina Limon is Senior VP of Public Policy and Industry Relations at uh, NAREP, which is the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Um, she leads the organization's policy and advocacy work, and um, that includes home ownership, housing inventory, credit access, I think is a big one, and immigration. Um, I want to say that Norina and NAREP, uh, the National, uh, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate <laughs> Professionals, I want to make sure I got that right because I sometimes <laughs> state it. I can hear you laughing. Um, uh, she works mostly at the federal level, but she was a powerhouse advocate for us in the fight for SB 50 the More Homes Act, um, which would have, for those of you who don't know, legalized apartments near public transportation and job centers. Um, and SB 50 was actually, I believe, the first statewide bill that NAREP uh, engaged with at that level, and we were really lucky and privileged to have that leadership. So thrilled to have you here. Um, af after Narina speaks, uh, we've got um, Robert Apodaca, uh, who is a leadership council member for the 200. Uh, the 200 is a statewide coalition of community leaders, opinion makers, and minority advocates. Uh, they work to mitigate the growing racial wealth gap uh, through home ownership and through uh, home building in California. Um, and we have had a long, uh, California UMB has been privileged to have a long relationship with the 200 since we were founded in 2017. Um, and they have been a vital partner in Cal with California UMB, instrumental in advocating for SB 50, and they continue to be a housing leader on all sorts of statewide housing, housing policy issues. And I'll add that um, Robert is also uh, the founder of, Z and I forgive me, I believe it's ZZen Advisors, which is a financial services firm that connects institutional capital um, with developers and real estate owners. Uh, so welcome, Robert. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna close out with Adam Brionis. Um, Adam is the Director of Economic Equity at the Green Lining Institute, uh, where he leads their banking, housing, and economic development work. Um, Adam is actually a recent, he recently returned to Green Lining, he actually started out there when he was very, very young, but he, his, he recently returned after serving as a VP of Real Estate Development at the Genesis Companies in New York, uh, which is a leading African-American owned affordable housing developer. Um, and in addition to his housing leadership, Adam and Green Lining are partnering with, Calif Adam and Green Lining are partnering with California Yimby, on a new initiative that we are launching called Home Team, which is a multi-year cross-sector cohort of diverse housing stakeholders. And we are gonna be working together to uh, build consensus around a shared understanding and strategy to resolve California's housing crisis. Basically, building a bigger tent uh, under which to do the work that we're doing, bigger and more inclusive tents. So, um, so I wanna welcome all three of you. Thank, thank all of you for making time to join us. And uh, I'm gonna start by just kicking it over to Norina. Thank you so much, Melissa. It has been a privilege to work with all of your team uh, as we work to advance or, or just work on the production of, of, of more homes and, and fix our housing inventory crisis. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak about my, my favorite topic. <laughs> At uh, NAREP, our mission is to advance sustainable Latino home ownership because we absolutely believe that it's the number one wealth building vehicle uh, for communities of color. When you look at the fact that the median net worth of all mortgage holders are 40, is 44 times the median net worth of all renters, so we're talking about a $231,400 uh, $231, versus $5,200 in median household wealth between homeowners and renters. So this is why home ownership uh, is so critical to, to our mission. So if, if you can show the first slide, please. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on the Latinx community. Uh, and most of the work that I am gonna be talking about is uh, from the State of Hispanic Homeownership Report. So if you go to the next slide, we saw that in 2008, Latinos lost two thirds of their household wealth. So now uh, in 2014, we set a goal to triple median household wealth. Uh, and as of 2016, which is the most uh, recent data that we have from the Federal Reserve, Latinos had a median household wealth of 20,600. So obviously, home ownership is good for Latinos, but I'm going to talk about the critical 
critical role Latinos play for the housing market as a whole, which is a different way of looking at this conversation. So if we go to the next slide, in terms of our report, we, we found that Latinos have accounted for 51.6% for of the overall U.S. homeownership growth over the past decade. Uh, in fact, we can argue that Latinos helped pull the nation out of a devastating housing recession in 2015 when Latinos became the first demographic to increase their homeownership rates after many years of declines. So up until the time of COVID-19, Latinos were on an upward trajectory as the only demographic to have achieved five consecutive years of homeownership growth, uh, reaching a homeownership rate of 47.5. According to our report over the past decade, Latinos have accounted for 40.4% of the overall U.S. household formation growth, adding 4.3 million new households. So that means that Latinos are driving demand for homeownership. Uh, the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies shown light to this uh, exponential role Latinos are playing in housing demand, where they predicted that Latinos will go on to account for 37% of the total household formation between 2018 and 2028. And then the share of household formation growth is only going to increase even further between 2028 and 2038 due to baby boomer losses. So if you go to the next slide, while the housing industry has long been tied to U.S. GDP growth, it's also becoming increasingly clear that the future of the housing industry is also tied to the Latino community. So according to the National Association of Home Builders in 2018, housing made up 16.3% of the overall GDP. But over the last two decades, the Latino contribution has significantly outpaced the overall market. Uh, Latinos have tripled their contribution to the housing share of the GDP, while the overall market only doubled its contribution during that same period. So if we go to the next slide, not only have Latinos driven demand for home ownership, but Latinos have also been intricately tied to the supply of housing and housing production. For the past eight years, uh, NARD's been reporting that housing supply shortages for first-time home buyers has consistently lingered as the principal barrier to advancing sustainable Latino home ownership. Now, the uh, National Association of Home Builders reports that labor shortages is driving a lot of this. Uh, in, according to our report, one in four construction workers was an immigrant, or Latinos made up 30% of the construction labor force. So these are larger shares, both immigrant and Latinos, than any other demographic. And we also saw the most acute labor shortages came from construction occupations where the share of both immigrants and Latino workers were most pronounced. And current immigration policies have only exacerbated these labor shortages. Next slide, please. And the close nexus that the housing industry has with the Latino community is only a microcosm of the role that Latinos play within the broader co context of the US economy. Latinos are young and the fastest growing population in the U.S. That means that not only will the U.S. rely on Latino consumption of, of goods, especially home ownership, but the, they'll rely on Latinos by a lot. Latinos have accounted for, uh, for over half of the total U.S. population growth over the, the last decade. Next slide. The, the age of the Latino community is also critical. At a median age of 29.5, Latinos are almost a decade younger than the overall, overall population. So in the context of home ownership, uh, we know that COVID-19 will have an impact on many of these factors that we're talking about. Uh, but not only are Latinos just aging into prime home buying years, but some of the indicators that contribute to home ownership gains will only be expected to grow. And therefore, the age and the population growth of Latinos suggests substantial future increases in home ownership growth. Granted that many of the policies reflect some of the needs of the Latino population um, in order for us to have the sustained, necessary sustained growth in a post COVID-19 economy. Next slide, please. Over the past two decades, Latinos have also had the highest labor force participation. Uh, Latinos have accounted for 71.3% of the overall labor force particip participation growth. 
So while a disproportionate amount of Latinos have lost their jobs due to pandemic related layoff, a layoffs, the role Latinos will play in the economy after this is all over is not, hasn't changed. As older Americans continue to age out of prime working years, young Latinos are gonna offset this anticipated losses in workforce. Next slide, please. However, you know, we saw that uh, the, actually, I think we skipped a slide, but it's okay. I'll talk to this slide real quick, real here. Uh, we found that by sheer numbers, uh, the top two markets that produced the most Latino homeowners was Houston and Dallas. But my hometown of Riverside, San Bernardino County, was uh, the fourth market to produce the most Latino homeowners, adding 33,898 new Latino homeowners in 2018. Next slide. So we see right here that Latinos, um, California actually had uh, the largest losses of Latinos, losing 205,000 Latinos, probably going to Texas uh, because of the cost of housing and the housing shortages uh, in California. Next slide, please. Uh, if we go back a couple of slides back, uh, more, one more, right there. So, so who are these new Latino home, home buyers? How can we stimulate the sustained growth of Latinos uh, purchasing more homes? Well, obviously we talked about the housing inventory issue being the most critical um, to to advancing home ownership. But if you look at Latino home buyers, they have a median age of forty. Uh, median income of 68,000. They have a median credit score of about 684, and they're purchasing homes with a median down payment of 3.5%. Uh, now, we're seeing a lot of pretty um, alarming credit overlays and a contraction of credit right now during COVID-19, which will further probably uh, constrain um, the homeownership growth we've seen for the past five years. And given, given what, I think to su summarize what I've said, Latinos play a very critical role in, in um, the home ownership conversation. When we talk about home ownership in America, we talk about the Latino community. Lenders know this, but somehow there's some sort of um, disconnect when it comes to many policymakers uh, not fully comprehending that if you cut out, if you look at this and Latinos have a median credit score of 684, they have, they're, they're uh, purchasing homes with a down payment of 3.5%. Uh, of, uh, you look at these credit characteristics and this is what's sustaining home ownership growth and obviously the availability of affordable housing. Um, this is so necessary for the overall growth of the economy. And so it's a broader conversation that we need to think about that when we talk about, um, about the, the, the home ownership gap, uh, between Latinos and non-Hispanic white population, we're talking about a 47.5 home ownership rate uh, and a 73.3 uh, home ownership rate for non-Hispanic white population. Um, and this can have a um, very negative impact on the entire economy because Latinos are growing at a faster rate. The demand from home ownership is growing. Uh, but at the same time, if, if the sustained population growth continues, we're going to reduce our general home ownership rate as a country um, in the 50s, which is the lowest home ownership rate we've seen uh, since the Great Depression. So um, that's all. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about uh, uh, and answer any questions, but I think I leave you with um, Latinos will play a critical role uh, in, in we need to think about this population when we talk about policy for credit access and when we talk about building uh, more homes. Robert, there you go. Sure. Okay. Great presentation, Lorena. I love your 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 graphics and great information. It's it's a hard act to uh, to follow, but anyway, here I am. Uh, we could go on to the next slide. Um, so the two hundred was started in two thousand five by John Gamboa and Hortensia Lopez and myself, 
And this was about the time that John Gamboa, who was then the uh, executive, dire executive director of the Green Lining Institute, was rethinking, uh, well, thinking about his next chapter in life. And, and uh, he was interested in housing. So that's when we first formed California Community Builders, which is a nonprofit. The 200 is a advocacy project of that. So at the time, we wanted to build some affordable housing in the Bay Area. And this was also about the time of the great uh, uh, mortgage crisis we had. And so we were in Washington, D.C., talking to uh, cabinet members and a whole host of individuals talking about um, the need to get the federal government to put more money into uh, home production and home ownership. And at this meeting, which we had literally several cabinet members, John introduced the idea of a, uh, a Marshall Plan, a housing Marshall Plan. And they just looked at us like, what are you talking about? Like they had never heard of it before. And certainly they were of the age where they would know about it if they had a, an education. Um, and so he explained to them what had happened following um, the war with Japan. And, and then they kind of got it, but they said, but we have a, a mortgage crisis and we can't be promoting home ownership during this crisis. So we came back to California with our tail between our legs and saying, well, we'll have to just do something on our own. And we decided that our first development, because that's what we want to do, was to build, house, uh, build home ownership uh, 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 in, in California. So um, Adam was part of this effort, uh, born and, 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 and uh, there you go, thank you. And, and where we built and sold homes in Fireball, California, which is in Fresno County. And we, it was originally supposed to be 21 units, but during that crisis, we only got a loan, construction loan for 10 units. And uh, then we decided to become uh, home ownership advocates. Next slide, please. So during that crisis in which, um, a lot of homes were lost in that time. Um, Nine million plus homes were lost. Uh, Latinos seem to bear the biggest brunt of all the foreclosures, as you can see by the comparison of Latinos versus Blacks. And then the wealth loss was tremendous. And this was after generations of wealth building and it was just all gone. And, and that was not the beginning of the racial wealth gap, but certainly we were beginning to make some progress, but after the, that crisis, we went, we, went, we went backwards. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> our mission has changed slightly. Uh, our original mission was to, uh, was to close the racial wealth gap uh, through home ownership. But now we're saying that our mission is broader than that. And that is that we wanna eradicate poverty and narrow the income gap of underrepresented communities through home ownership. And I wanna reemphasize the eradication of poverty because we believe that in fact, it's, it's, it's going up considerably. And home ownership is, is part of that solution. And so we've expanded that mission. Next slide, please. So here are some members. We, we have uh, over, well over a thousand members throughout the state, but we have a leadership council of around 20 individuals that meet every Friday at 930. And we discuss a lot of ideas, a lot of action plans. And you can see your fearless leader on there. I think he should be on there. But yes, Brian Hanlon is on there. Yay, Brian. Uh, he's been a great partner and a great contributor to our efforts. Next slide, please. So in California, as, as you know, um, California is the golden state. Everybody wants to live in California. A lot of people just come over from other parts of the states, from other parts of the world to come to California. And so there's been a tremendous economic growth for many, 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 many years. And so with that, um, population growth. And with population growth, of course, there's an uh, increased demand for housing. And unfortunately, um, for, for too many years, at least for the last 10 years, the people responsible, the home builders and apartment builders have not been able to keep up with that uh, demand for it because regulations for one, increased cost of, of land and some other factors. But and I'll get into one of the major reasons for that. So it's it's really economics 101 and, and, and that with uh, greater demand than supply, rents go up, home prices go up, but in the last five years, it's just been out of control. And, um, and it just very few people can afford to buy a home uh, in, in California. So now we have this historic uh, crisis, even before COVID, we were saying this was a historic crisis 
And yet the state of California was not addressing that crisis uh, in a really responsible way. Next slide, please. So there was a saying that here in the Bay Area that you would drive to until you could afford a house. So in that case, you would have to drive out to Manteca. You'd have to drive out to uh, uh, Tracy. You'd have to drive out to Stockton. Um, and the, but not, not further north than that because then you're bumping into people from Sacramento. But you'd have to drive a long way. So in Los Angeles, you would have to drive all the way out to San Bernardino to buy an affordable new construction home. You have to go out to Riverside and you could uh, be with a Norenz family, great place. And we have a lot of members from San Bernardino and, and, and Riverside. But with that, you had increased transportation costs. And so people started to look at what is the cost of increased housing costs and combined it with transportation costs. And, and uh, they realized that people were spending a lot of their disposable income on both transportation and housing costs. And then, you know, if you're out in San Bernardino and Riverside or in the Central Valley, you're going to have increased utility costs. So it's pretty tough, you know, not living in the coastal cities. Of course, it's so expensive. So you have to move inland or you have to go way out in, in, into the inland empire and, and costs get really expensive there as well. And then there's the factor of uh, the super commuters of the physical and mental health issues that come with commuting, uh, you know, 90 minutes each way every day. And that's, you know, the, the family misses you. They realize, they wonder if they really have a father or a mother. And then all along they're contributing to the air pollution. Next slide, please. So the legal solution for us, after trying to talk with the state of California, we, we concluded that one of the biggest factors contributing to into the increased cost of housing is regulations. And these are the regulations coming from the uh, California Air Resources Board and other uh, agencies who've been fighting climate control. Now we believe climate control is a very important issue for, for, for us and, and the rest of the world. But unfortunately, they're trying to win the climate control war at the expense of, 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 of home ownership and home, uh, and home builders. Like they're putting the whole solution on that industry, which is just really unfair because it's having a, uh, uh, this, a disparate effect on our communities. So we were, after negotiations with CARB uh, fell through, we were forced to do what every American would do, and that is file a lawsuit against the state of California. And we did that in 2018, and, uh, and that's still uh, pr uh, proceeding. And then, of course, we wanted a lot of information from uh, uh, as many as 10 agencies that all had their fingerprints on coming up with these regulations. They wouldn't give it to us. So we had then file a second lawsuit, a public, uh, public Records Act suit in Sacramento, and they've tried to uh, 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 drop that, and, but we have uh, proceeded with that. Now, the last lawsuit, which we filed in December of 2019, is known as the Vehicle Miles Traveled Lawsuit. Next slide, please. And this was, a, this was, this was a lawsuit filed in San Bernardino County because um, this is where, and it's not the only county that's really going to uh, bear the brunt of, of this issue. But basically, the, Cal the state of California regulators do not want you to use your car, even if it's an electric car. Therefore, you can't, um, the developer has to discourage the use of a car to take your children to school, go buy groceries, or commute to work. And so the developer has to provide each family with bus passes. Uh, I don't think there's light rail going out to Riverside, to Los Angeles. So, but you have to provide these bus passes. So the mitigation cost uh, in San Bernardino is going to be $400,000 per home. So if you thought you were going to get a deal and buy a home for 500000 in San Bernardino, it's now going to be 900000 That regulation, which by the way, has not been approved by the leg legislature, takes effect July 1st of this year. <clears throat> and I spoke with a group of legislators just recently, and they do admit that it was not authorized by them, but these regulators are running rogue on, on the state. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so not wanting to just rely on a legal solution. Uh, the 200 also has introduced, uh, did start off with the year introducing two bills. One was for a, a, a massive plan for home ownership. 
Uh, we had two great offers for that, but it didn't meet the new COVID uh, screen to move forward. So we had to drop it, put that on hold. But a second bill, AB 3155, uh, which increases home ownership opportunities for moderate income uh, household looks great. We're scheduled for a hearing on May the 20th. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, increasing housing at, at a sm smaller developments of 10 units or less. Next slide. So we think that really the solution to eventually have affordable market rate homes is uh, we need to have more affordable condos. Right now, the condos that are being built in San Diego, San Francisco started about $1.5 million or $2 million. We need affordable condos. We need more affordable townhomes. And we need more affordable single family homes. And, and both the industry have to work at that. We also need to have lower uh, regulations uh, and, 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 and get rid of a lot of these mitigation fees that are really unfair. And then of course, we also are, be, are real practical. We need to be bigger advocates for smaller homes. You know, right now, you know, 4,000 square feet might be, it's a typical home being built out in the suburbs. That's just way too big. And we think that smaller homes would be um, better. We think that there should be more ADUs and I'm a bit, we're a big advocate as, as, as well as that. And finally, we also believe that home ownership units on public lease land is also an, uh, uh, an alternative we should look at. And, and in fact, you can really bring down the cost of, of townhomes and, and condos if, if it's done on leased land. So with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. Um, we are actually not uh, normally by this, I'm more behind. So we're actually doing well. Adam, please uh, feel free to take the full eight minutes. Um, I'm gonna kick it to you and then I'm just gonna trim the end so we still have ample time for questions. Absolutely, thank you, Melissa. And, and, and thank you, Norena and Robert. Those were, those were fantastic presentations. Uh, you know, I think one of, the, one of the great things is when your co-panelists sort of cover most of the things that you wanna cover for you in your presentation. So I'll keep my remarks fairly brief. Uh, again, my name is Adam Brionis. I'm the Director of Economic Equity at the Green Lining Institute. And one of the most common questions I get um, about Green Lining is, you know, where does the name come from? And, and I think in short, Green Lining, Green Lining was founded as an antidote to redlining, which is obviously the uh, government sanctioned uh, denial of capital to neighborhoods based purely on skin color. Um, so we were founded in 1994. And we're a multi-ethnic organization. We were founded by leaders from the African-American, Asian-American, Latino communities who saw a dearth of capital in our communities, a dearth of business opportunities, and, and said that, you know, this couldn't stand and, and we need to fix this. So, you know, our work grew out of banking and banking advocacy. And today we're actually a multi-issue organization that works on everything from energy to telecommunications to the environment. And uh, my group, specifically the Economic Equity Group, works on housing, small business, and uh, general economic development issues. And so, you know, I'd also wanna mention that we have a coalition of about 50 multi-ethnic organizations, uh, everything from ethnic business chambers to faith-based community development groups, uh, to grassroots nonprofits throughout the, throughout the state. And they're, they're really how we, we push a lot of our work forward. Um, and so, you know, today I'm going to talk about uh, home ownership specifically, but, you know, in general, I really focus on what we consider to be the primary concern of people of color in the country and, and in the state, which is really wealth building. And I think as Norena and Robert both said, the, the fastest or, or the most common way that most Americans build wealth in this country historically really has been through home ownership. And, and that's why we put such a big focus on it, because at the end of the day, if we really want to build wealth uh, amongst people of color, what we're talking about is home ownership. So let me talk a little bit about the type of work that my team does and, and how we do it. Um, historically, a lot of our work has really been based around the Community Reinvestment Act. And for any of those that aren't, aren't familiar with uh, the Community Reinvestment Act or CRA, it was a law passed in 1976 by Senator Proxmire. And really all it did was say that if you're making money from a community, you have to invest in that community. Uh, rather than just pulling money out, you have to put money back in. And so you know, within the context of the CRA, uh, Greenland meets annually with some of the largest banks in the country. Uh, we hold them accountable uh, to the type of work that they're doing in our community. So that includes home loans, small business loans, um, the type of the diversity of their promotions within the organization. Um, and uh, one of the most important things that we do is that when banks merge, we actually intervene in those mergers and, and we stand up for the community and bring the community perspective uh, to the job that some of these trillion dollar corporations are doing um, amongst low income communities and communities of color. 
And then, you know, in addition to our work directly with large banks, um, we do a lot of research. We're what John Gambo used to call a think and do tank. Um, so while we do engage in policy advocacy, we meet with uh, federal officials and regulators and state representatives consistently. Um, we also do a lot of research. Uh, every year, uh, we produce an annual report uh, using Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. And for anyone that's not familiar, uh, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA, um, for, for those folks that work with it, um, basically what it says is that banks um, can do whatever they want in terms of home lending. They, they don't have to change any of their practices, but they do have to stand up for it, and they have to be transparent about who they're making loans to and, and what families are actually um, uh, benefiting from their home loans. So every year we, we collect data and, and we show that consistently people of color, specifically African-Americans and Latinos, uh, consistently um, you know, are, are unable to access mortgage credit throughout the state and frankly throughout the country. Um, you know, I think before the uh, before COVID-19 hit, uh, the mortgage market was moving further and further out of reach for most people of color. Uh, African Americans and Latinos combined make up about 45% of the state, but only receive about 25% of the loans in California. Um, and one of the issues that we run into consistently is that while on paper, uh, the Asian American community does do a bit better in terms of mortgage lending, because there's a dearth of data um, specific to the different communities within the Asian American community, it's very easy to paper over what are some very big disparities uh, amongst home ownership. Um, for instance, Southeast Asians, uh, and Koreans in, in particular, very impacted um, by a lack of um, fair mortgage lending. Uh, so, uh, you know, so overall, uh, again, about 45% of African Americans and Latinos, they, they get about 25% of loans in the state. Um, and, you know, again, overall in, in California, only about 31% uh, of households can actually afford the median home price. Um, and as I think uh, was mentioned earlier, you know, one of the reasons we focus on home ownership so, so um, targeted in such a targeted manner is that the wealth gap is, is so big. And until we address home ownership, the wealth gap is only going to get larger. Um, in America today, for every dollar of wealth that a white family has, uh, African-American or Latino family only has about 10 cents of wealth. And so that's what we're really trying to fix when we talk about home ownership. Um, of course, you know, COVID-19, we're in the middle of it. Um, right now, African-Americans are dying at a rate of three times uh, uh, the white community. And, and obviously, we're seeing a lot of very disparate impacts right now in terms of health. But we're also seeing a lot of disparate impacts in terms of the economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, so right now, we have about 20 million people uh, out of work, of which most of uh, a disproportionate amount of people of color. And then on the small business side, uh, about less than 5% actually of small businesses owned by people of color have received uh, federal funding from uh, the small business uh, set aside that came out of the federal government. So right now, you know, we had a problem with home ownership in the state. COVID-19 is going to exacerbate uh, disparate health impacts and outcomes, and it's also going to impact uh, disparate economic outcomes uh, in the short term. Um, and then, you know, as we hopefully pull out of this epidemic right now, or this pandemic right now, you know, we're asking ourselves a lot of questions at Greenlining. So I think first, you know, what role is the banking sector going to play in the recovery and, and what types of products need to be created and established for people of color um, to, to really access home ownership post COVID-19 and, and frankly, just um, to sustain themselves in the future. So, you know, one idea that's out there is do we need to, to look at an alternative product that lengthens the amount of time of the standard mortgage, taking it from 30 to 40 years? Um, and one of the issues we, we, we spend a lot of time on is, you know, how will the growth of non-bank lenders impact access to capital in the state in the future uh, for underserved communities? Uh, Non-banks are now five of the 10 largest uh, mortgage, uh, mortgage lenders in the state. Um, but unlike traditional banks, they're not regulated in the same way and they don't have the same type of transparency and reinvestment requirements. So what role is, is going to have non-bank lenders taking over more and more of the mortgage market going to have on home ownership rates um, and, and hopefully the positive outcomes of home ownership on, on communities of color? And then lastly, one of the reasons that Green Lining is so excited um, to be following the lead of California Gimby is that at the end of the day, until we address our uh, supply problem in terms of housing units uh, produced and created in California and some of the systemic barriers that are holding back housing supply in California, you know, the, the opportunity for home ownership is really just going to fall further and further out of reach of, of people of color. Um, my understanding is we're about, and this is for rental and home ownership, about 3 million units short, uh, housing units short in California. 
And so if our state is about 60% people of color, you know, what does that mean for future generations? What does that mean for not just homeowners, but renters? Because when you see a, a lack of supply, you're driving up costs and you're driving down vacancy. So uh, at, a, at a certain point, um, as, as California YIMBY and my co-panelists have said, until you really start to address the supply issue, you know, Greenlining and other organizations can only do so much on the financing side. And, and, and we really need to, to find solutions both on the supply and the demand side. So I'll go ahead and wrap up there and, and give it back to, to Melissa. Thank you so much, Adam. Adam, uh, Robert, uh, Norena, these were really wonderful comments. I, I'm excited to hear, hear the questions um, that people have for you. Um, I'm going to kick it off with, with one question, um, for, and I welcome each of you to, to respond to this, but I'm curious, um, right now, what do you see as the single biggest barrier to home ownership um, and housing stability um, when we're talking about communities of color? And, and, and Communities of color and or the Latino or the African American community specifically. Um, and I'll, I'll shoot that, um, I guess I'll go, I'll shoot that to Narina since she went first last time. Oh no, there's, uh, there's a lot. I think before the, um, before COVID-19, I would have said house, housing inventory is the number one barrier. I think we've shifted a little bit to access to credit. Uh, I'm very concerned with the contraction of credit that we've seen in the market. And I think a lot of it is being uh, ex exacerbated by um, what we're seeing a, a, a liquidity crisis with servicers right now. So with so many people going into forbearance, uh, investors still have to make those payments on those, on those missed mortgage payments. So uh, unless the, um, the industry really rallies to provide some sort of liquidity facility uh, for these institutions, the contraction of credit will, will increase more and more and more. And like I said, these credit overlays, we're seeing lenders right now that are putting a, a minimum cre um, credit score requirement of about 700. When you saw that Latinos have a median credit score of 684, uh, higher, um, higher down payment requirements, uh, lower DTI requirements, all of these things cutting out uh, communities of color, uh, which is, is very troublesome. So I think these are the things that I am the most concerned about right now. Obviously, you know, communities of color have experienced uh, an, a disproportionate amount of layoffs. Um, so the income instability um, is also very troublesome. So I know that was more than one, but I I'm very worried. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Robert, how about you? Well, I, still, I still think that the um, uh, supply is, is the biggest issue. As, as Adam pointed out and everyone knows, we don't have nearly as much housing units out there to reach equilibrium. And the demand is, and, and it's just going to get worse. And and even in so like in, in this year's uh, truncated uh, legislative session, um, um, the, the the legislature really hasn't been focused on on production issues. There, there are a lot of bills, you know, upwards of seven hundred bills that are introduced every year, of which you could get up six hundred of them and throw them out the window. They they, they didn't mean anything, and yet yet there's you know, uh, CEQA uh, and, 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 and the son of CEQA and, and the, the cousins of CEQA, all those CEQA related, VMT is a CEQA uh, related law regulation. Those are just have a stranglehold on, on production. And then at the same time, I think it's imperative that, that the whole uh, housing industry, the, uh, the, the, the home builders need to think about, you know, downsizing the size of homes they're building and then also somehow or another uh, building closer to all the job centers because, um, um, you know, that's, that's where the people are living. That's where the houses are really needed right now. And so maybe we start off incrementally as we're doing it with uh, AB 3155, trying to fast track developments of 10 units or less. And that it's not going to solve the housing crisis by, by any means. But still, you, we can add, you know, hundreds of thousands of homes near job centers where they're really needed. And, uh, and then, of course, ADUs are, are another way that we can begin to address the, the, uh, the, the housing crisis. So it's not just one, one product itself. There are just multiple products and, and, and multiple areas of the state that we need to focus on increasing the production. Thanks so much. And um, California is a big, big supporter of 3155. It's, it's a really... It's a good bill. It's 
look at them. Thank you. Um, uh, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. So, so just to wrap it up, I, I, I'd say, you know, big picture, um, I think we have to deal with, uh, with a country that has a long and deep history of systemic racism. And we see that everywhere from income to health outcomes to voter participation. And, and that's not really something that our state alone can solve. Um, but what I think what our state can solve is the extreme zoning uh, issue that we face in, in our state, where in Los Angeles and my hometown of Oakland, it's uh, you know, illegal to build anything but a single family home on, on uh, I think two thirds or, or three fourths of the land. And, and I think until we create a, a zoning structure in our state that's fair and reasonable and actually uh, can be responsive to the growing communities, most of which are people of color, you know, we're gonna be creating a, a, a housing market that's completely out of whack and broken and, and make it so that, um, you know, home ownership and even affordable rentals is, is gonna be out of reach of most of the people that are, um, you know, coming behind us. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm going to say I'm going to start pitching some questions to individual uh, individual panelists. Um, but if you want to like uh, piggyback onto someone else's, I'm not going to cut you off. Just kind of give me a little wave and I'll, I'll come back to you. But I'm going to go back to Adam. Um, this follows up really nicely. Um, we had a question from Mitch Menken. Um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about increasing home ownership as a wealth building tool. But knowing that we will never have 100% home ownership or certainly, you know, that's unlikely. Um, how can we create opportunities for renters of color to build wealth? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a really great question. And, and I don't think anyone, you know, on this panel or at California Gimme would say that everyone must own a home and it's absolutely the right option for, for every single family. I, I don't think that's the case at all. And I think definitely what, what we're looking for is more of a balanced approach in the state rather than such a lopsided situation. Um, but one of the one of the areas we also focus on at, at Greenlining um, and spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we create more entrepreneurs and small business opportunities um, you know, within communities of color and underserved communities. Um, unfortunately, one of the areas that you know, we, we see hardest hit right now is really within the small business community and particularly amongst uh, sole proprietors of color. Um, when you look at areas around access to capital, areas around um, you know, uh, using an LLC to protect your assets, people of color are, are, are way behind. So I think going forward, where I would love to see more of a focus if, if we are talking about something besides home ownership is you know, how we create more entrepreneurship opportunities. How do we make California an easier state to start and maintain a business, uh, especially considering um, you know, those communities that historically uh, have been denied access to capital? And, and I'd say you know, um, one thing that, that California needs to be thinking about is Prop 209 is still on the books. And even though we know that, you know, uh, a, a race drives so many issues that we see in our state and in our society, the state has its hands tied in, in how it can deal with it. So it has to rely on workarounds and, and inefficient solutions rather than just saying, well, we know that African Americans are disproportionately impacted by COVID. Let's create a, let's create a strategy for that. So, so one thing I think that we have to fix in the state beyond uh, zoning and all the other things we talked about is really being targeted and, and really centering race when we talk about solutions to these issues. Thank you very much. Um, Robert, I have a question for you. Um, and I uh, just want to note for everyone that we've got about 10 minutes max to take questions. So, um, but are, are you looking to help those interested in, in tiny homes um, and specifically around financing, local, state, and county regulations um, as a strategy to ease, uh, to ease any extra steps to gain home, home ownership? Is that something that the 200 is looking at? Yeah, absolutely. We're, uh, we, we, we are looking at that. We're looking at... Um, we're looking at uh, take like an Alameda County. There are uh, like 10,000 vacant lots. And so if you were to say, uh, you know, 6,000 of those uh, are maybe in a single family uh, zoned area. Um, so at a minimum, th there should be an opportunity to uh, build uh, a three bedroom, two bath home there and also put in an ADU in the back. And uh, so we that's when one way just at a minimum increasing uh, uh, density in, in, in the city of, of o Oakland. But what we really think uh, with the proper zoning uh, uh, adjustment, as Adam referred to, we'd like to see more duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes built as increasing the su housing supply. And I, I know for a fact uh, um, uh, that um, in, in, in many areas, there are some, some families that are able to buy a duplex 
and then they, so they're they're the owner of it. They're they're um, they're building wealth, but at the same time they're providing uh, 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 housing for a relative or 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 for uh, uh, or or for a grandmother or grandfather. So we need to create those uh, entrepreneurial investment opportunities for people to own uh, more more homes. Great, thank you so much, uh, Noreen. I'm going to pitch you this question and. Uh, uh, so it's a good, this tricky question. So this is from David Salem, and he's asking, um, isn't there a tension between home production as a wealth building tool um, versus home production as a tool for lowering the cost of shelter? Um, he's asking, uh, so since home price appreciation raises overall housing costs, uh, can't we do the most good for people of color by lowering housing costs? Um, I mean, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think both happen at the same time. If you produce more homes, you, uh, you, lower, uh, you lower the price of housing and more people will have access to that entry level uh, home as a first time home buyer. I think the problem is right now, I live in San Diego and you know, the median priced home, even during COVID is in the high 600,000s. So that's, that, that cuts many people. If you, if you look at, you know, what the median income is for communities of color, that, that you know, makes it difficult to, uh, to purchase that home. So I think, uh, I think they both happen. So <laughs> I think is the, is, I don't think there is a tension. I think we're, if we produce more homes, we lower the price, uh, and, and therefore we allow more people to enter into home ownership so that it becomes uh, a wealth building. I think what we're talking about is, is not just uh, for existing home buyers to increase their own equity. Uh, I think what we're talking about is to bridge the, the, the wealth gap. So to allow people to have that, like we talked about the difference between uh, renters and, and homeowners, uh, in median household wealth being 44 times um, that of a renter. I think that's what we're talking about. So I don't think there's a tension. I think, I think we can achieve both. Great. But I also think, I, but I also think that that the, the the home builders need to start building smaller homes. Yeah, There's at the, at the entry level, mm -hmm. thousand square feet. They need to build some minimally at twelve hundred square feet. I mean, there you know there was a time when uh, the median square footage of a lot of homes and and and, and a lot of the big cities was like about nine hundred square feet, two bedroom, one bath, tiny closets. And, uh, but nonetheless, um, people need to adjust and live in, small, in smaller homes. I realize that families can't do that, but there's, there's just a lot of people without children. There are a lot of seniors, you know, you know, that if they could afford to move into a smaller home, they would do that. Yeah, and you can definitely fit a three bedroom, two bath home into about 1,250 square feet. There are a lot of them. Um, so uh, at some point we'll have to do another panel that's about how do we shift the, how do we shift to uh, incentivizing the building of more individual units of smaller homes rather than these giant homes, because that's a whole great topic. Um, so I'm going to, I have one more question for you, Adam, and then I'm going to give everybody about 30 seconds for a closing remark. Um, but this is a, a question that I um, wanted to raise, which is, um, or that, that I wanted to share. Uh, it's from Dietrich. Uh, and forgive me if I've got this name wrong, Dietrich Sager. Um, and he's asking, if I'm correct, FHA loans are only available to a certain percentage of con condominiums and only to approved condos. Is there any known information as to whether this impacts the ability for low-income people to get financing for condos, or if this incentivizes traditional single-family homes? Um, is this being, dis is, is this you know, being policy? You know, Dietrich, I I actually, I'll have to admit, I don't have a good answer for you right off the top of my head, but I think that's a great question you're asking and something I'm really interested in. So while I don't have your contact, it's something just know that I'll be following up on because I think I, I would like to know the answer to that as well. Um, but, you know, somewhat related, one thing that we would like to see is, you know, how can we create more home ownership opportunities that aren't just single family homes? You know, how can we look at the, the condo market? How can we look at the co-op market? And how can we create ways to, to um, you know, incentivize the creation of lower cost housing that is also building infill and in, in a multifamily setting? So. Great. Um, and so if, if we figure out a good answer to that question, we'll definitely get it, get it back to our uh, attendees. We'll tweet it um, out. Okay, so for all the panelists, um, 
Quick closing question. One argument we often hear when advocating for more housing in our communities is that we need to preserve neighborhood character. Uh, can you assess that argument um, in terms of the communities you represent and help us understand how, to, how, how you think is the most, what you think is the most effective way to counter it? And I'm gonna kick that, uh, uh, Robert, you sure. wanna go first? So preserving, uh, preserving their neighborhoods, is, it, that's code, that's racism. And I'll just call it out. They just don't want, they don't want multifamily. They don't want smaller homes. They just, they, they, they want it, their, their neighborhood's gonna be priced so that it's not achievable for, for ethnic minorities to move in there. And uh, we, should, we shouldn't tolerate that. They, you know, uh, it's, and, those, and it's those cities that are, are not, um, not increasing the production of homes as required by law. Thank you. Uh, uh, Narina? Uh, I would agree with, uh, with Robert that it's code for something else. It's code for not in my backyard and in many of the just frustrating uh, exclusionary comments that we hear when we talk about uh, building more homes. And I think my, my lasting thought on this is that we can't afford as a country and we need to think about this issue as a macro problem. We can't afford, this goes back to my presentation the role that housing plays on the US economy uh, and our ability as a nation to rebound from this COVID-19 crisis uh, depends on our ability to meet the demand for housing uh, in the US. And communities of color are, are, um, are driving demand for housing. So you have to understand the characteristics of communities of color, their median income. You have to understand um, the, the um, credit access or credit profiles when you think about access to credit. Uh, and so it has a ripple effect on the entire economy. So this micro or, or just kind of uh, looking at, at um, your own condition and your own character of your economy uh, is really short-sighted. And I think right now as a country, we're in a, in, a, in a time of crisis and we need to think about how we all pull up our boots uh, bootstrings and, and pull the nation forward. And this is one of the ways that we're going to drive our economy after, um, after COVID-19. And, and, and so that's what I would say. <laughs> Putting people back to work to build homes sounds great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Adam? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just echo uh, my co-panelists and, and specifically Robert. We're, we're in a pandemic, so, so we need to be honest. Uh, you know, preserving neighborhood character is, is racist language. It's, it's code for, for keeping people of color out. It's code for, for maintaining a, a certain demographic of, of non-poor people. Um, so we, we should do away with that and we should call it what it is. Uh, and then second, I think that we as a state and we as a country have a man-made crisis on us in terms of the home ownership crisis and the wealth crisis. Uh, and so if we want to solve those things which are imminently solvable, we need to have targeted real solutions and those solutions need to have conversations about race and inequality uh, embedded in them from the start. Thank you. I wanna thank Adam, Narina, and Robert for joining us. Um, I clearly should have made this a 90 minute uh, <laughs> Panel, I apologize. Um, I know I would. I could have uh, listened to another uh, ten questions, um, uh, but I hope that you will all uh, consent to join us again in a future panel. Uh, and really want to thank you for your for your incredible contribution. Um, for those of you uh, uh, for those of you attending, um, a couple of uh, uh, closing uh, closing remarks. Um, I want to invite you uh, to join California Yimby and Partners on Thursday, May fifteenth at six thirty p.m. for. Uh, an event that I think is a, a great follow-up to this one. It's redlining the legacy of housing segregation. Uh, and in this event, we'll be doing a slightly deeper dive into neighborhood redlining. Um, and I encourage you to, uh, to RSVP. Um, a link for that event is going to be included in our follow-up email. Um, and then I also want to encourage you, if you're interested in volunteering or getting more information, sign up for our informational emails uh, and see, uh, included, those will include our, uh, uh, action alerts, but also um, events like this. Um, please uh, check out the California Yimby Action Hub. Um, I'm sure this is being put into the uh, uh, chat as well, but it's californiayimby.org slash action dash hub. Um, and I want to thank everybody for attending and uh, hope that you had a great, uh, a great evening and we will uh, be following up with you via email in a few minutes. Bye everybody. Thank you everybody for attending. This event has been recorded and will be available from caemb.org slash events in a few days. Or you can visit our Facebook page 
at facebook.com slash CAMB slash live to see this and all future events. Thank you for attending.